Our next talk is from Hannah Davis. Uh, Hannah Davis is a generative musician, musician, composer, and researcher based in New York City. Um, she's the creator of Trans Prose, uh, which programmatically translates, translates text into a musical piece with similar emotional tone. Her artificially intelligence powered music programs have been played at the Louvre, the BMW Museum, the Fabrica Alta, and others. She's a contributor, a major contributor to ML5.js, which is a library that's uh, basically bringing machine learning to the web, especially for artists and designers, um, for which she has created data sections, various data sets, and the pitch detection model. And uh, you may know her from her workshop yesterday, which was about using LSTMs and neural networks to generate MIDI and, um, and lyrics. Uh, I want to welcome Hannah Davis to the stage. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hannah Davis, and today I'm going to be talking to you about music, emotions, data, more emotions, and more music. And my journey into this basically began with something called data sonification. And for those of you who don't know what data sonification is, it's basically just data visualization, except instead of representing data through graphs and charts, you're representing it through sound. And so I'm going to play a couple of my favorite examples of this, just so you have an idea of this space. So in a different realm, this is uh, one of my favorite pieces by the legendary Amanda Cox, um, who was at the New York Times, called Fraction of a Second. And this is basically sonifying the speed at which um, Olympic athletes cross the finish line. And if you look at this visualization, you can see that it is pretty close, but if you listen to it, you can really just tell it's so much closer. Um, this next one is by James Murphy from LCD Sound System. Um, he made a piece based on tennis data from um, the, uh, several tennis matches, actually. And so in this case, the mappings are not one-to-one. -one. Um, instead, the data is working together to kind of create something more atmospheric. pieces actually are all on SoundCloud and they're all really beautiful and I recommend looking them up. Um, so there are basically three types of data sonification. There's audification, which is just directly converting the data to sound, interpreting the data as amplitude over time. Um, there's parameter mapping, which maps the values of data to components of the sound with the focus being on highlighting the data. And then there's music generation, which maps values of data to components of the sound, but the focus is more on generating interesting musical pieces. And um, so this is kind of where I've focused in this third category. And data sonification is really cool because sound has particular strengths. Um, it's temporal. It's capable of representing many dimensions at the same time. It's really good for uh, cycles and pattern finding and structure finding. Um, as we saw in the Amanda Cox piece, it's really good at identifying small differences. Um, it's great for streams of data and hearing changes. It's very unique. And finally, it's emotional. It moves the listener. And so I'll take this point to switch over and talk about my work with emotional data. I got really interested in emotional data um, back in 2012 when I found this um, data set, which was just this singular question, how did the candidates make you feel? Um, and it was amazing because this was, this was like just tracked over decades. Um, 
And I was into data visualization at the time, and kind of every way I prototyped um, this data out, it just didn't come across as interesting to me. And around the same time, I found out about Chernoff faces, which in general are kind of looked down upon in data visualization because they are really hard to convey data. Um, so like this example here is like one of the worst ones I've seen. This is like um, application, this is, yeah, application scores for a job interview. Um, so like the head height equals the grades, the eye size equals board scores, um, eyebrows equals autobiography, which I don't even know what that means. Um, so the visualization is just not really relevant to the underlying data. But I thought it would be great for this data set. Um, so basically, I map the anger to the slope of the eyebrows, the fear to the height of the eyes, the pride to the length of the nose, and hope to the curve of the mouth. And um, I think through doing this, it really created this kind of accurate representation about how people were feeling at the time of each of these elections. Um, so don't particularly remember this one. Um, but for those of you who remember this one, everyone was kind of meh on this. Um, and then really extreme with Bush in 2004. And then of course, 2008, we had Barack Obama's hope. Um, and that's where the data set ended after like these decades of being collected, which was unfortunate because I would have been interested to see the last couple, um, particularly the last one. So, um, so I started just playing around with emotional data. I, I actually used Kyle's face OSC to do um, an hour on the internet where I just tracked my own face um, for an hour looking at uh, whatever I was browsing. Um, and then through this project, I just ended up liking the kind of linear box visualization effect, which I ended up using for my first sonification. And for my first sonification, I was um, creating music based on the different writing style of different authors. Um, so here, each note is a word. There's a low drum for each syllable. Um, oops, sorry. Um. Yeah. Um, and then descriptive words like adjectives and adverbs are an octave higher. And I love this because Hemingway just has no descriptive words. project, but um, pretty fast all the songs started to sound the same since there weren't that many variables. And so I was trying to think of what was interesting about different pieces, and um, it's the emotions. And so I wanted to go kind of further into this space, and so I had two questions for myself. Um, the first being, can I translate emotions between mediums programmatically? And the second being, can I create a musical piece with the same underlying emotional tone as the novel? And so this led to a project called Transprose, um, which is a program that generates music from text that I worked on for a while. It basically uses a word emotion corpus um, with these eight emotions, fear, anger, joy, sadness, anticipation, trust, disgust, surprise, and then general positive and negative. And so I used these um, emotions to get basically splines of emotions throughout each novel. So the novels were represented in um, emotion splines like this. And then I mapped those to things like tempo and octave and pitch, um, increasing melodic movement at particularly emotional points so that the plot is heard not in literal events but in the emotional representation of those events. And so I'll play you a couple of pieces, but first I want to play you um, a couple of 
things that didn't work with this, just so I can appropriately set your expectations. Uh, so a couple of the first prototypes were missing complexity. Order. And emotional accuracy. This is Heart of Darkness. Um, so, let me show you a couple of full pieces. So this is um, Lord of the Flies. And these pieces are all about a minute long. And you're welcome to just listen to it, but if you want to um, kind of listen to it a little bit more in depth, you can hear that it basically chronologically represents the novel. Um, you can listen to the octave, um, which represents positive to negative emotion ratios. Um, shorter notes indicate more emotionally dense areas of the novel and complexity and dissonance indicate higher emotion levels. And for the opposite end of the spectrum, and these were all created by the same algorithm. And this next one is one of my favorites because it's really complex. It's the story of a protagonist doing really, really horrible things in a pretty happy tone, and I think the music reflects that. So I also applied this process to transcripts of the 2016 debates. Um, in both, uh, Clinton was generally more positive and active, um, where Trump was more negative and passive, though both candidates had high levels of tr trust, anticipation, and fear, which makes sense when discussing the future. And I won't play um, all of these for you, but just a little clip so you can get a sense of it. So I actually separated these um, so they're compared against each or themselves over the course of the three debates rather than each other. So this is Clinton's first debate. In the second debate, her joy levels rose. And 
and then in the third debate, her fear levels rose. And then Trump, on the other hand, here's his bass line. Um, in the second debate, his anger and fear levels rose. And then in the third debate, his anger levels rose above all other emotions. actually sounds sadder to me, which I think is more appropriate. Um, so another project I did with this in this kind of same vein was a project called Symphonology, where I worked with a French composer um, to basically turn news articles talking about the rise of technology over time um, and try to sonify that. So I created um, a little bit richer piano pieces, which were then uh, fleshed out and played or played as an orchestra. So that's much longer, so I just wanted to play a small clip. Um, but after that, I started getting interested also in, um, like, all those other pieces kind of used emotional structure as the underlying foundation. But I wanted to see if it was possible just to create a sonification with something that seemingly had no um, pattern, because I believed there was a pattern to be found in, it, in kind of anything. So I don't believe in UFO sightings, I guess, but I found this really interesting data set of them. Um, which is, this is just from the first um, seven months of 2008, all the sightings, and um, this was basically my prototyping uh, sonification just to see if there was a pattern. So these are like some of the descriptions of these events. And it turns out there was a pattern, and the pattern was that most of the UFO sightings happen in the evening hours, um, which created this nice underlying rhythmic structure that I was able to use in the piece I'm about to show you. Um, so this one is just using samples and basically tying them to the descriptions, where this next one is like a more formal composition based on it. So in this next one, one beat equals one day. The note duration is related to the UFO sighting duration. Um, the percussion is related to the description length, the woodwinds are an element of emotion or in timing, and the choir vocals are elements of talking or abduction. Um, so I'll play for you. So one other thing I've been really interested in recently, um, although I've stopped working on it for a little bit, is um, creating music from film. So this is kind of automatically generating um, film scores based on the content of the uh, video. And so basically this was just my first prototype to show myself that it was possible, and this is just making a composition with the note C um, over the course of four different video genres.
So I don't know if it works for all genres. <laughs> All right, we'll move on from that. Um, so that's something still in process. Uh, one of my favorite projects I did last year was um, for this collective called D20 based in Italy, where they were basically, um, they renovated this old factory, that, this old industrial building, um, and made it a musical instrument. And so they, they had some uh, grants to give to musicians to create actual compositions for the building. And so this was a new type of piece, sorry. This was a new type of piece for me. So for this one, they actually provided two sets of um, sound samples, one of the building actually being in, in use in the 1920s and one of children imitating the building sounds. Um, so I actually used T-SNE to just um, make some connections between those two sets and made like composition choices based on that. and then this was played on the actual building itself. So that was a really fun project, um, but let's go back to the data for a second. Um, so this corpus I used for transprose uh, was something I worked with for years before really diving into it a little bit. And when I did, I found um, that the word childbirth had been tagged as having zero emotions. And this was like horrifying to me as I'd been using this resource for like a ton of projects. Um, but it got me really interested in this idea of just subjective data. And subjective data for me means um, basically these five things. First, um, just generally emotions and other subjective experiences. How can we incorporate these into AI, especially as AI starts moving toward really complex and personal areas? Um, how can we capture abstractions like emotions in data sets and model things like personality and life experience? Um, the second area is what I've been tongue in cheek calling artisanal data, uh, which is creating or curating data sets um, explicitly subjective data sets for the purpose of artistic projects and things like that with no claims to objectivity. Um, the third is just deconstructing objectivity in data sets that already exist. Uh, what kinds of subjectivity can we find in commonly used machine learning data sets? How they were created? What were the motivations behind creating them? Um, where the data comes from and what it leaves out? Who funds the data sets? Who are the taggers on things like Mechanical Turk? Um, and where the data set breaks down. Um, another section of this is historical bias in that a uh, culture's current set of values is a type of bias that's basically captured in a data set at the time it's created. Um, and how can we avoid that bias retention over time? And is it possible to update data sets with newer values? And one, of, one thing I'm pushing for is that um, data sets should have labels the same way food has labels and um, it should include things like ingredients, it should have expiration dates, um, and it should include, yes, where did this come from, who made it, what's inside, uh, who will be harmed by this. And there's so much to explore in this whole area. Um, I think creative taxonomies, like creative ta creatively tagging different data sets is definitely one area um, of that, even for something like demographics. Um, this was just for like a workshop I did instead of demographics asking like, if you could choose, would you rather live near the mountains? Um, how many years have you spent in a small town? How many siblings did you grow up with? 
Um, but my main focus in this area has been in actually creating and working with smaller subjective data sets. And so my first um, data set that I created was of emotion tagged landscapes. And so it was seven different types of landscapes, field, forest, ocean, road, lake, city, and mountain. And then um, eight different emotions, anger, anticipation, joy, fear, disgust, trust, surprise, sadness, and then also a none category. And I used Crowdflower for this, which is kind of like Mechanical Turk. You can make your own um, tasks and people will tag your photos. It's, I think, slightly higher quality than Mechanical Turk. Um, and one thing I liked about it, which I thought was valuable and responsible, was that there's a tight feedback loop between um, the people tagging and yourself. And so one difficulty I had with Crowdflower is that in order to weed out bots, they make you give them 10 correct answers that all humans have to correctly pass, which is obviously really hard and subjective um, data. And so I did that at first, you know, just tagging the emotions I thought any picture um, kind of evoked, and everyone got so mad at me. Um, so, you, you know, I was getting feedback like this, how can you say it's incorrect, it's a subjective question. Um, but, um, also, the other good thing is that you get rated yourself on how good of a, um, like, I guess, manager or task creator you are. So at the beginning, when I did those questions, I was basically rated like a two across the board. And then I finally made the questions, basically, you could choose anything except you couldn't choose none and an emotion. And that worked. Um, and so the reason I chose landscapes, specifically without any people in them, is because I wanted a fairly neutral um, type of data set where it would, I could still show that there was um, subjectivity involved in it. And the results I got were actually really good, I thought. Um, so this is a joy field, a trust field, and two anger fields. Um, this is a couple samples from disgust in general. As you can see, there's a lot of browns and greens and like lakes and, and mud. Um, the fear was a really interesting category because you both had this kind of clearly visually scary forest and also a kind of um, impending doom of this cloud. Um, but then in this third one, you also have um, the wide open ocean. And so it's actually capturing both visual emotions but also conceptual emotions as well. Surprise was actually interesting because um, a lot of the surprise tagged photos had bright areas of color um, or light and dark contrast, which was a finding that was surprising. Um, so I did a couple of experiments with this. This was a super basic emotion style transfer where my question was just, can I, again, translate content between emotions using NVIDIA fast style transfer um, network? So this was a fear for forest turned into a joy forest. Um, a, the reverse, a joy forest turned into a fear forest, where the, sorry, the output is at the bottom. Um, a fear field to a trust field, and I noticed a lot of uh, photos with clouds don't really work, because um, the clouds get turned into a color. Um, this was an angry city to a joyful city, kind of worked. Um, a joyful forest to a fear forest, which worked, I think. Um, and then a sadness to joy ocean. Um, but I was particularly a little more interested in actually generating emotional images based on this data set. And so my question was, can I basically generate emotional variations of the same base image? And this is pretty difficult with a small data set, but that was um, part of my challenge that I wanted to prove that it was possible. So I first tried a, a GAN, which just totally broke, um, I think because of the size of the data, but I had success with a um, conditional VAE based on Emily Denton's work. Um, so I'll show you a couple of outputs from that. And this is kind of a weird project to show. Um, basically, each row I'm about to show um, are, is the same set of images just through a different lens of emotions. So the best way to uh, watch this is to basically keep your eye on like one or two columns and see how it changes over time. So for example, the first image will stay this, the same image throughout all the emotions. 
So these are, these are just general landscapes right now. So anger, anticipation, disgust, fear, joy, sadness, surprise, and trust. And this is just a second set of the generalized ones again. So you can see as a whole that these emotions come through. Um, and then I did specific landscapes. So these are um, generated mountains. So angry mountains, anticipation, disgust, fear. And I noticed in um, the mountains, the, um, the level of the horizon changed quite a bit. So fear and anger were a lot higher. The, the mountains are a lot higher where joy is um, the mountains generated were lower, which was interesting. Sadness, surprise, trust, and then generated forests. So these are angry forests, anticipation, disgust, fear, joy, sadness, surprise, and trust. Um, and what's interesting about these results are that it's a very, very small subjective data set and it still has noticeable effects over the different categories. All right, um, so I use this data set also in ML5.js, which I'm going to make a small pitch for. Um, so ML5.js is the sibling of processing in P5, um, which came out earlier this, or I guess last year now, um, last summer. And it's designed to be a friendly machine learning for the web in the same way that processing in P5 has made programming accessible to um, beginners. We're hoping to make machine learning also accessible to beginners. And so it has a lot of um, really great components. You can do simple classification with pre-trained models. Um, you can do image classification um, with images. So this is a robin with just a couple lines of code. Um, you can do real-time um, detection, image detection. Um, also with not much code. There's the style uh, transfer algorithm has been ported. Um, style transfer with a webcam in real time. Um, there's word to vec capabilities um, for those of you who like to play with text. Um, the LSTM model, which some of you saw yesterday, uh, where you can actually generate um, words based on your favorite author. Um, and then one thing I ported was the pitch detection algorithm. Um, so I made this little demo. I'm trying to learn how to sing. Um, you can also teach your robot to sing. It's a little glitchy. Um, but so one other important component we're incorporating is just from the get-go, uh, starting to think critically about these data questions in machine learning. Um, so like, where does data come from? And a lot of what I had just spoken about earlier, just responsible data collection, where do you pull things from, um, attributing data, et cetera. But it's made by a ton of amazing people and everyone, we're always looking for more contributors, so feel free to reach out at ml5js.org. Um, so some recent work, going back to emotions now, um, one of the most recent projects I did was called The Laughing Room with author and comedian Johnny Sun. And this is basically a room that's embedded with a neural net that would listen to what participants say and laugh if they thought it, it, laugh if it, thought it was funny, basically. Um, it was really a, a great project to work on. It really reminded me kind of what is um, so interesting and joyful about this field. Um, and it was really about the idea of like performance and who we're performing to, especially when it's kind of this like imaginary audience, which in this case was the room. So it was designed to look like a sitcom. So these are the actual just participants. Um, and we had a, a huge audio setup. I, this was fairly recent, so we don't have good documentation back yet, but um, we hired like an audio and video technician. We had multiple live streams on various platforms over the course of three days. Um, and 
Um, basically, so the data set was 155 comedians, stand-up comedians. Um, I decided only to use women and people of color just to eliminate the possibility of just like, well not eliminate the possibility completely, but lower the possibility of just totally racist and sexist humor. Um, trained over it, just basically the course of a day. And I'll play you just a couple of clips from the live stream. It both um, laughed at things that made sense. It's got a little direct. And then also things that didn't particularly make sense. Um, so that was a really fun project because it was just like the project equivalent of like when you lay on someone else's stomach and then that person laughs and then, I don't know if you all did that in camp, um, it was just like an endless three days of laughter. Um, and so there were some, you know, some things that, so these were the funniest things that it found, um, that it laughed at. So I really loved this one. I think about Alexander the Great and Kermit the Frog have in common the same middle name. Um, that's a pretty great one. But the thing it liked the most was, uh, I think, um, oh wow, fruit. So, you know, neural net, you can't really tell what the output's gonna be. Um, it also really liked the word fish, which came up in a few places. All right, and then finally, um, so what I'm working on now is I'm basically trying to get back into what I am calling regular music, but is just not, I mean, not actually doing regular music. Um, my first component of this is machine learning generated ASMR. And for those of you who don't know ASMR, it's autonomous sensory meridian response. And this happens to like some people, which is, I'm not in this category, but I'm really interested by it, where basically you um, get this like interesting sensation by hearing what kind of sounds like clicks and um, like tapping and really interesting noises. And um, this was my first project using WaveNet where um, I thought this would be a good, or like an interesting thing where you can kind of have like contentless generation but still get the sense of um, that this is clearly ASMR. So I generated some of that. <laughs> Um, which, I, which I thought was cool. And so I've been basically, um, I'm planning to make an album where each song has some different machine learning generated or maybe even non-machine learning generated component. Um, I'll play a tiny clip of that. So this has the ASMR in it. And so that also had a uh, glitch piano, which was like on a slight delay. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much.